V for Vendetta by Alan Moore and David Lloyd. And we open with David Lloyd's initial introduction. A few nights ago, I walked into a pub on my way home and ordered a Guinness. I didn't look at my watch, but I knew it was before 8 o'clock. It was Tuesday, and I could hear the television in the background still running the latest episode of East Enders, a soap about the day-to-day -day life of cheeky, cheery working-class people in a decaying, mythical part of London. I sat in a booth and picked up a copy of a free newspaper someone had left on the seat beside me. I'd read it before. There wasn't much news in it. I put down the paper and decided to sit at the bar. It wasn't a busy night. I could hear the murmuring of the distant TV above the chatter of the people at the bar and the clack clack of colliding snooker balls. After EastEnders came Porridge, a rerun of a situation comedy series about a cheeky, cheery prisoner in a comfortably unoppressive, decaying Victorian prison. Almost imperceptibly, Spirits leaked from the optics of the upturned bottles behind the bar. Droplets of whiskey and vodka formed and fell soundlessly as I watched. I finished my drink. I looked up and the barman caught my eye. Guinness? he asked, already reaching for a fresh glass. I nodded. The barman's wife arrived and began to help with a trickle of customers' orders. At 8.30, following porridge, came a question of sports. A simple panel quiz game featuring cheeky, cheery sports celebrities answering questions about other sports celebrities, many of whom were as cheeky and cheery as themselves. Jocularity reigned. I'll tell the barman about the leaking optics, I thought. The nine o'clock news followed, a question of sport, or at least for thirty seconds it did, before the television was switched off and cheeky, cheery pop music took its place. I looked over at the barman, just half this time, I said. As he filled the glass, I solemnly asked him, why he'd switched off the news. Don't ask me, that was the wife, he replied, in a cheeky, cheery manner, as the subject of his playful targeting bustled in the corner of the bar. The leaking optics had ceased to have any importance for me. I finished my drink and left, almost certain the TV would be silent for the rest of the evening. For after the nine o'clock news would have come The Boys from Brazil, a film with a few cheeky, cheery characters in it, which is all about a bunch of Nazis creating 94 clones of Adolf Hitler. There aren't many cheeky, cheery characters in V for Vendetta either, and it's for people who don't switch off the news. David Lloyd, the 14th of January, 1990. And now for Alan Moore's introduction. I began writing V for Vendetta in the summer of 1981. Okay, 
I'm just joking. I can't carry on Alan Moore's uh, accent for that long. So, I began writing V for Vendetta in the summer of 1981 during a working holiday upon the Isle of Wight. My youngest daughter, Amber, was a few months old. I finished it in the late winter of 1988, after a gap in publishing of nearly five years from the discontinuation of England's Warrior magazine, its initial home. <clears throat> Amber is now seven. I don't know why I mentioned that. It's just one of those unremarkable facts that strike you suddenly, with unexpected force, so that you have to go and sit down. Along with Marvel Man, now Miracle Man, V for Vendetta represents my first attempt at a continuing series, begun at the outset of my career. For this reason, among others, there are things that ring oddly in the earlier episodes when judged in the light of the strip's later development. I trust you'll bear with us during any initial clumsiness and share our opinion that it was for the best to show the early episodes unrevised, warts and all, rather than go back and eradicate all trace of youthful, creative inexperience. There is also a certain amount of political inexperience upon my part, evident in these early episodes. Back in 1981, the term nuclear winter had not passed into the common currency, and although my guess about climactic upheaval came pretty close to the eventual truth of the situation, the fact remains that the story to hand suggests that a nuclear war, even a limited one, might be survivable. To the best of my current knowledge, this is not the case. Naivete can be detected in my supposition that it would take something as melodramatic as a near-miss nuclear conflict to nudge England towards fascism. Although, in fairness to myself and to David, there were no better or more accurate predictions of our country's future available in comic form at that time. The simple fact that much of the historical background of the story proceeds from a predicted conservative defeat in the 1982 general election should tell you about the, how reliable we were in our role as Cassandras. It's 1988 now. Margaret Thatcher is entering her third term of office and talking confidently of an unbroken conservative leadership well into the next century. My youngest daughter is seven, and the tabloid press are circulating the idea of concentration camps for persons with AIDS. The new riot police wear black visors, as do their horses, and their vans have rotating video cameras mounted on top. The government has expressed a desire to eradicate homosexuality, even as an abstract concept, and one can only speculate as to which minority will be the next legislated against. I'm thinking of taking my family and getting out of this country soon, sometime over the next couple of years. It's cold, and it's mean-spirited, and I don't like it here anymore. Good night, England. Good night, home service, and V for victory. Hello, the voice of fate, and V for vendetta. Alan Moore, Northampton, March 1988.